Welcome to your city commission meeting. Please turn off or silence all cell phones during the meeting. In accordance with Kansas Open Meetings Act, the meeting can be viewed live on Channel 2 and via Facebook Live. The public is encouraged to view the meeting using one of those options. The Leavenworth City Commission meeting is open to the public with limited seating capacity. To mitigate the spread of COVID-19 face coverings and social distancing is required to attend the meeting. Refer to the agenda packet on the city website on how to reserve a seat and or submit comments. Meetings are televised every day on Channel 2 at 7 p.m. and midnight and available for viewing on YouTube and Facebook Live. Our first study session uh, item is Leavenworth School District, USD 453 quarterly report. Uh, Mr. Jake Potter, welcome. Good evening, thank you for having me. Um, I'm here behalf on tonight on behalf of Dr. Roth, who had a previous engagement. Um, I want to give you an update in terms of how schools are looking. It was just over a year ago that we were convened by the Leavenworth County Health Department and other superintendents as we made at the time what we thought was an excruciating decision to postpone spring practices. And that later became the suspension of the entire school year. So much has changed in that last year. And we've actually been able to see some normalcy in that. This week, we started spring sports practices. And we were able to get through a full slate of academic and athletic and academic competitions, um, doing some creative kinds of things, sometimes in person, doing the social distancing kinds of things that we're doing here tonight, as well as Zoom. So debate tournaments this year happened via Zoom. Um, and just amazing how our students and staff adapted. Um, but going back to the county health department and this week, um, we're fortunate enough to be in one of the earliest phases of educators to receive the vaccination. Um, so this Thursday, we'll receive our second dose of that. And that's been a, a phenomenal process that Jamie Miller's team, and um, we work a lot on a weekly basis with Violet Gomes and Lisa Haddock as they help us negotiate close contacts and potential exposures. But the, vac the vaccination event has been awesome that we were able to get all of our staff through that are interested in a single day event. Um, we did that the first time on February 4th. The second time will be this Thursday, both on school days, and we're able to phase our, our teachers in and out in a way that we were able to keep school in session. Um, because of trying to be proactive as possible, we did make the decision to make this Friday, the day after that second vaccination date, a no school day um, based on anecdotal information about how individuals might respond to that second vaccine. And also for us, we've allowed our substitute teachers to take part in that pool as well, which would then, of course, would um, may make it more likely that we might wake up and find some more staff absences. So um, we're also able to do that without any other real school calendar impacts. We were one of the first districts in the state of Kansas to begin school this year. We started one week early using that hybrid concept where we have 50% in and out. Mm -hmm. And our philosophy was always to, to go slow and build speed to where we could have a sustainable calendar. And by the end of October, any student that wanted to be in person for five days a week was in level with USD 453, mm -hmm. which again, I think makes us one of the one of the top in the, in the state of Kansas who was able to, to get to that level and also sustain it throughout the course of the year. Even as we saw cases increase into October, November, uh, we made some tough decisions and a lot of the information we presented to our elected board, the Board of Education, was the evidence that we had no, had no signals of any classroom student to student transmission. And that was in large part due to the diligence of our staff and our students that they were wearing their masks, they were washing their hands, they were distancing from one another. When we did have quarantine exposures, it was largely something that had happened offsite, a household quarantine situation, and we'd work through those two weeks where they'd get educational services delivered remotely and get them back, back in session. So we have been able to sustain that calendar throughout. Um, we're off for a scheduled day off a week from Friday, then we go right into spring break. And other than that, we plan to be in session up through April and May. Last scheduled day of school is May 27th. Um, so that's been awesome. And again, can't say enough about the perseverance of our staff, um, also our families. There's been certainly some frustrations along the way as we've tweaked things and done things differently. Um, one of probably the biggest frustrations this year is we're down to our last six months of bond construction from a $36.7 million bond issue that passed in 2018. And we have some amazing facilities that we've not been able to properly do ribbon cuttings for because we've had a strict adherence to no visitor policy. We're hoping to be creative and have some delayed 
uh, grand openings as soon as this summer. Um, but as you can imagine, as parents, we have parents super anxious and excited to see the place that we get to have the privilege of seeing their kiddos five days a week. And we've had to either show that via photo or video or social media. And you know, parents are really excited to get in and see it. And our community is as well, having supported that issue. Um, specific to the bond and what's happening right now, um, we are fully done with our fifth, sixth grade addition to the Richard Warren Middle School campus, the intermediate school. It's amazing. It's unlike any of the schools any of us attended at this table. And again, excited to get you all over there to see what it looks like to have a true collaborative space. And we're using that concept as we flow into the middle school. So we have some three pod areas where each of those grade levels can get together and work in a, in a totally different way than the traditional classroom setting. Over the course of this summer, we'll take that concept down to the elementary schools, and each of those elementary schools will get a different kind of collaborative space, working with the principals and teachers and what works best for them. Probably the biggest and most significant in terms of what we think will have the future impact for our school district is the revisioning of what was Lawson Elementary School into the Earl Lawson Early Education Center. That will become the sole location where we'll serve students kindergarten and pre-K. And that will, is on schedule to open when we start back school August 18 for the 21-22 school year in a brand new facility um, using that existing footprint. So we're super excited about that. It is on schedule. And that'll be probably one of the biggest shifts, um, especially those longtime Leavenworth USC 453 families that are used to their neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. All their kindergartners and pre-K will be going to, to the new early education center. Um, so again, we're hoping to have some kind of groundbreaking there June and July. Hopefully conditions are a little bit better and we'll have some outdoor space to be able to work with as well. Um, and then also um, outside of the bond issue, we were able to do some, some creative things and using capital outlay dollars, we're adding four ball fields right outside the adjacent to the Warren Middle School complex. That's an active job site right now. And we had some great support from the city water department today to come out and give us some assistance. And uh, we will have four ball fields that are be ready to go on schedule for March 20th. So it's right around the corner and oh, wow. these uh, warm weeks moving ahead has really helped that schedule. So it's gonna give our ball players some flexibility that they haven't had um, and be able to really give a nice new signature um, opportunity to host some events, um, uh, you know, substate kind of things like that that we've also been able to do at our high school gymnasium. Um, so that's specific to the bond, um, really truly down to our last five or six months of bond construction and then we'll just be punch list and um, things like that. So can't say enough about the support we've received from the city, specifically Mike McDonald and his team. Anytime that we wanted him to come to the table to look at prints or to work through the, the traditional inspection process, those kinds of things, it was always it, whatever we needed. So I can't say enough about the support from him and his team to make that, that process easy for us and the, um, the construction crew that, that, that we, we partnered with as, as that project moved forward. Um, some, some highlights uh, in terms of some normalcy, as I said. So we were able to get through our full um, suite of academic uh, athletic competitions, have some highlights. Probably most noteworthy is the Leavenworth JOTC Raiders are back from their national competition, um, coming back with a third place finish. And overall, they had some of the highest finishes they've had. Um, the female team finished in second, which is the highest in team history. The males placed third, which is the highest in team history. Coed placed fourth. And we came back also with the fourth ultimate male Raider. Um, 17 trophies in total. And wow. that, that's, a, that's another, uh, that's, that, that's a group that uh, when, especially early on when we were learning what contact tracing um, impacts of for the, those teams to be able to compete at a high level um, when masked versus unmasked and really make it through a season is remarkable. And we, the, the, the quarantines we had for teams, I feel, were way less than what we heard other districts and teams were doing, um, which is thanks to the support of our and the buy-in of, our, of our, all of our student participants and coaching staff to make sure we were, we were operating as safely as possible. Um, basketball is almost wrapped up. Our girls are still in play. They're actually tipping off right about now at Lansing. Um, so we're looking to see what that highlights like. Uh, both boys and girls bowling sends individuals to states, which happens this Thursday. 
Um, swimming is also this weekend, sent a number of boys swimmers to, to the state level. Wrestling wrapped up, a couple of individuals made it to, to state both on the boys side and the, the girls side now has a dedicated tournament where we had Hannah Jackson finish as a runner up for the second consecutive year. And on the non-athletic side, you know, musical competitions, all those things have been largely Zoom or um, largely restricted attendance in terms of spectators and which is a little bit harder for a performer to play to not a sold out house. Um, but even uh, most recently, our, our high school drama department conducted and, and streamed uh, a musical production of Little Women. So again, just to be able to still provide opportunities to students when they look back will be like any other two-year period from their peers and still have some normalcy is, has been, been really cool. Um, the shift now for us as a district administrative team and board is rounding out this year's events and trying to be mindful of that senior class so we can honor as many traditions as possible. And we're doing that in a way where if we can bring classes together for events, obviously prioritizing the seniors and their families. Some of those events, we might be able to open it up to juniors as well. For example, when we do the high school academic banquet, we usually do that for all four grade levels. This year, we'll just do juniors and seniors, seat, seat families together, family units. So we're sort of honoring that cohort concept. So the last thing we wanna do is have a big event and then come back and be quarantined for two months out of April or May. Probably the two biggest signature events that we're starting to get questions on that are still being ac actively planned is how we'll handle prom. Uh, the prom right now is being handled or planned by the junior class cabinet, and it will largely be a senior-only event, and looking at outdoor options is how we're trying to pull that off with uh, as safely as possible. And then just second to that would be graduation. The plan for that is to move back outdoors, which each graduate will receive four tickets for their families. In the event that we would have to move inside for inclement weather, we would restrict it then to two individuals. And we're working with partners to make sure that we're streaming that event so those individuals that can't be there, either because of our own ticketing policy or serving overseas or some of the other situations that we have on an annual basis, they can feel like they're a part of that. And we'll have a nice video product as well so that they can make sure that they're honoring uh, the academic achievement of not just this year, um, but a long 12 years worth of, worth of service. So the last thing I would say um, is that we are you know, looking at some of the funds that are coming to school districts to help actively plan and support what might have been some learning loss situations. Um, we had about 20% of our students elect to go rigorous remote, which means that they never stepped foot on campus this year. Some of them knocked it out of the park and some of them may decide that's their best way to learn. Others maybe struggled a little bit more, didn't have the home support to make sure that they're getting into classes on, at the right time on the right schedule. So we don't know yet exactly what the last year is from a learning loss perspective. Um, we didn't have state assessments last year. We will this year whether how that looks compared to two years back of data will be one one snapshot and there's lots of other different assessments that we look at as well um, act scores of the high school level all those things um, so what we'll do as a district is not try to spend all of the additional resources that we get right away we're going to be strategic as possible about it and no we're not going to get all of that learning slide back in one summer um, but that said we are definitely looking to offer a robust summer school opportunity this year for those students that want it and those families that are recognizing that their student might need a little bit more assistance uh, to get kept caught back up for August. And then we hope by August uh, we're planning to continue with our safety protocols at that, that point in time unless things are way relaxed both at the city and the state level mm -hmm. and of course we'll respond according to lead, accordingly to that you know a plan for the worst and adjust for the best. Uh, the good news is our staff and students are used to to coming in the doors in that manner, uh, being respectful of the rules and being able to maintain levels of attendance again that I feel like are right up there with anybody else in the state of Kansas. So with that, I'd open it up to any questions you'd have. Yeah, uh, Mr. Potter, uh, just a couple things. Uh, well, first, congratulations to the Raiders, of sure. course. That's great. Uh, for the new facility that has the pre-K and the kindergarten, mm -hmm. I mean, do you have even a rough estimate of how many children mm -hmm. will be? I'd, I'd say it'd be approximately 300 students. 300, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then what was, uh, for graduation and prom, what are, do you have dates for those? I was sure. Curious. Um, the prom is May 1st and graduation is May 22nd. Okay. Okay, and I'll just open it up to the other commissioners. Did you have anything? Well, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, great job on your report. Yeah. And thank you to you and your team for keeping our students and as well as our teachers safe. Appreciate, Appreciate that. that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, quick question, Mr. Potter. You said the ball fields will be ready March 20th. They're going to play this year on those new fields? Yep, that's on the plan. all four of them? Or? That's the plan, yep. Oh, I thought they were letting one, you know, uh, mature or something for a year, but they're going to go on them. No, I believe that's the plan, yep. yep. Yeah, three weeks, two weeks. Interesting. And uh, are those limited uh, attendance to... So I don't know exactly what the spring sports, um, since that just since practice has just started this yeah. week. Um, what we've been following is two spectators per, yeah. um, but there has also been a little bit more accommodation for some of those outdoor sports. So baseball, softball might look differently okay. um, than some of the yeah, other I'd sports. Like to there, you know, just watch a game. Watch it, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Commissioner Griswold. Good to hear about the vaccinations for the staff and faculty. Without being, you know, real precise, was there a good percentage of the staff and faculty, the teachers and the staff that took the vac vaccinations? Yes, and what was encouraging is, you know, you have some of those either skeptics out there or mm -hmm. some that aren't even, you know, comfortable with a flu vaccination. So we had some that watched their coworkers survive <laughs> um, and get through that that now are signed up for their first and maybe weren't planning on it ahead of time, um, but now are getting in that loop too. So, yeah, we were, we were, we were, uh, we are appreciative of those that took that opportunity for but sure. You're, you're, and I won't ask you for the specific percentage, mm -hmm. but Dr. Rose is comfortable with the, because I know it's not mandatory. Yep, but absolutely. The more teachers said, and more staff and faculty that get vaccinations, the better, obviously. Right. And we did open that up to substitutes that support our Good. district, as well as transportation drivers, largely Easton Bus and, and Ricks that are with our students on a daily or weekly basis. How is, generally has the, how has the health been of the staff and faculty? I mean, in terms of, because I know if, if someone gets um, either a student or a staff and faculty, there has to be some quarantine procedures and things like that. Generally, how is the health been of the staff and faculty? We've been good, actually, um, and maybe even better than some cold and flu seasons. I think some of that is we've really encouraged staff not to come to work if they have any symptoms. And some of our teachers, you know, want to be at work every day, even if they've got a cough or a sniffle, um, in which they're getting some of those, you know, for because kids have student coughs and sniffles too, right? Right. Um, so the fact that they've been really diligent about that and, and, you know, washing their hands, all of that, I think, has led to some healthier outcomes anyway. Um, but we've had a strong substitute pool. So when we <coughs> have had some of those two-week quarantines or two-week uh, situations where we've had a staff absence, we've been able to, to fill and keep on going. Yeah. I think one of the byproducts, at least, Anecdotally, is that um, with the public health measures, is that there's been a much, uh, very much a decrease in the in the seasonal flu, you know, cases. And you know, uh, we're taking area. temperatures every day. Um, yeah. Some of those things, I think, help to ward off. And if you know that you're feeling sick, last thing you want to do is drive all the way into work and be sent away. So, some right. of that I think has helped to 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 keep, I think, everybody just health minded. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Is that you didn't have any? No. Thank you. Okay. No. Thank you, Mr. Potter, and pass that along to the faculty and staff. Keep up the good work, and tell uh, Dr. Roth, too. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for your support. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, next item on the study session is Main Street 2020 Annual Report. And that's uh, Mrs. Scheidt. Come up here, please. Thank you, Mayor Coach Town, Commissioners, and staff. I have Lori Edward and Dan Linton here for my board. Yep. <coughs> Water. Get that pipe. My allergies. We are safe. <laughs> um, so, you know, crazy year. Uh, we're uh, maybe in recovery, we, we don't know. But um, many of you um, hopefully uh, watched the presentation. Okay. <clears throat> I won't go through everything, but we did um, pivot to survival mode, and the office was um, pretty much open all of the time. There were a couple weeks where Marley and I switched off some, some times. Um, you know, we really pushed out all of the funding opportunities, the hire, the idle, the PPP, um, all of the other available um, funding for the merchants, knowing that, you know, they were... In some tough times, um, they uh, those that were deemed essential did really well. <laughs> those that couldn't open yet, you know, they 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 really um, worked around what they could do. Some remodeled their businesses, some um, cleaned. <laughs> we knew that they were the safest locations to be at, much safer than the big boxes and whatever. But anyway, um, they're dedicated merchants. 
So um, we knew that it was imperative that safety was first during this period. Um, we tried to pivot and make sure that businesses could do any activities we offered at no cost. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were getting folks directly into their businesses, um, rewarding consumers for spending money and spreading the word that it was downtown was clean, safe, and social distancing was easy to do. So early on, um, I asked Christy at CVB if she'd like to partner on this, and we did, and we did some homemade signs. We got out there, we talked to the merchants, and some of the videos are further down in the PowerPoint, but we wanted to get that out there, that um, they love their consumers, they want to do everything they can to bring them back in. Um, more of those photos. So let's see, did you all watch most of the videos? Do you want me to play some of them? I watched a couple. Of I think the, uh, this one is one of the, uh, This is the video that um, Christy and I worked on Never with the so Union so Pacific. You're not going to feel like a stranger or an out-of-towner to pop in. We treat everybody like their friends and family. Never worked with the first community. People are friendly and uh, let people pull together. It's a very wonderful hometown community, partly because of the fort up here. We have a lot of people coming in and going out, so it's, it's just constantly being able to meet new people and, and still have all the our friends within the community that continue to come downtown and support us too. It just, it's a wonderful community here. So you get to dine, enjoy a beautiful walk from Broadway to the river and back with really super friendly, comfortable in their skin people. And also our customers have become our friends. We don't call them customers anymore. Oh, here goes our customers. They both came. One thing people will tell people when coming in here, then it's a family environment. Yeah. So that's why people return over and over and over. So you like that easy now? I have no idea how much you grow from your customers and how I can't believe I'm the center here and my customer brings you flowers or brings you lunch or you just you just become so close to them. They mean they mean the world to you. It's a beautiful and historic downtown, and everybody that comes through is always commenting that, oh my gosh, they didn't realize Leavenworth was such a relaxed and inviting community. And it's a city, but it has that small town feel. It is the heart of Leavenworth County. It's unique. You know, we're one of the first cities to ever be established in Kansas, and it makes it a destination spot for sure. It's a place to come visit, a quick little weekend getaway. We actually have people that come from other states. They've been here from, um, they're from Kentucky. I have folks from South Dakota that drive in. And there's a lot of upcoming boutiques and stores that are, are that are new like us. We're gonna be open our full hours. We'll do whatever we need to do, maybe in business. There was a series of videos that you were able to uh, mm -hmm. put together. Now, was that um, because of some any funds that were provided as a result of COVID-19? Well, this particular video was part of the Union Pacific grant that I applied for through mm -hmm. Kansas yeah. Main Street. Right. And so it was competitive. It came out. Um, we had about two weeks to get it together to even come up with a new mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kicked that off on June 15th, and I think around the end of May we were notified of that. Mm -hmm. So that was open to communities that had a Union Pacific going through them, cool. Kansas Main Street communities. Mm -hmm. And then um, Christy and I, you'll notice on some of the other video initiatives, um, mm -hmm. So some of these first videos were um, ones that Christy and I did together just informally on her phone, and we interviewed a number of the merchants to get those out. Mm -hmm. And then we hired Toto TV to do the um, professional one, and they gave us a short version, a long version, and a... Um, <laughs> a medium. Hovering over. 
<laughs> I can't think of the word right now. Um, so anyway, um, did most of you watch most of those? Do you want me I to play them. any? I watched a few of them, but um, yeah, I love the videos. I think, I mean, that's a great idea. And you think you'll continue just doing I would imagine videos? we will. Yeah, we've got some new activities coming up in the spring. I guess spring's here almost. So yes, we will continue with I those. I mean, it really can't, or even the one you showed, you know, mm -hmm. it captures just businesses and the community mm -hmm. and how heartfelt it is. Yep. Uh, how people, you know, the togetherness. So no, I really like them. So maybe, um, do you want to play the second one on that one, Taylor? The Facebook? Yeah. This has military memorabilia, which is military gift shop now, and Momo's in the tune shop, I believe. And then we'll... And it showcases lots of people don't realize what military memorabilia they sew all these patches on and uh, for the military. Military memorabilia. <laughs> so we're doing our best to, to help bring people back into the community as they feel comfortable. And uh, I'm enjoying seeing some people we haven't seen for a long time. So I hope to see you when you feel Hi, I'm Eric from the Tomb Shop here in downtown Leavenworth. We are starting lessons back up next week. And looking forward to our 300 students a week coming to take lessons. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, Eric, you know, it's the tune shop. They do classes there, they sell instruments. I was given the back, back, back door tour one day. It's amazing all the work that they do on all of these students' instruments. I mean, it's just a factory back there that um, Eric and his staff work on. So it's just um, every time I go in, and I've tried to ask the merchants if they'd like to showcase, you know, their background, you know, what they did before they had a business, et cetera. Most of them don't want to do that. But it's very fascinating when I get to see those things. And the so, tune shop's been around for a long time, hasn't mm -hmm. it? I don't know how many like, years, but... Like in the 80s I know sometime. the family of guy I went to high school with, his parents owned really? it in, in the mean, 60s. Okay, that, yeah, that I remember when I was a little kid, okay. so uh, se early 70s, so yeah, yeah maybe 60s. It was definitely there in the early yeah. 60s. I mean, in addition to the Some citizens who, who <laughs> lived in Leavenworth all their lives, the families, yeah. military is well aware of it, <coughs> and, and if their children are mm -hmm. involved musically, they, a lot of times they'll, they'll work with the tune shop. And, sure. So. He's out and about in the schools all the time and in the community, and so that just resonates with all of the merchants, be them if they've been here a long time or if they're just coming in. Um, it's, it's amazing what their backgrounds are. Maybe nothing related to the retail that they do or the restaurant, but um, sometimes it is. So we won't play anymore unless you have something specifically. We might play the awards video later in the presentation. Okay. Um, so we'll go on to the budget. We started with a $174,200 budget, and uh, we always, um, you know, do those checks throughout the year to see where we're at. We ended up with $129,656. And this um, pretty much shows you where those incomes came from and our program expenses. Um, so uh, our building income, that's from our rents because now we have our loft done, but it was only done as of May 1st. Uh, and then we have um, a few uh, additional mural uh, repairs and um, projects that we had to do, taxes, loan interest. Mm -hmm. So we had an ending balance of 883, but we tried to make that really stretch as far as we could. It really helped to have the PPP, the Sparks, which was designated from Secretary Toland that each Main Street would get that $4,800, even though it was competitive for all businesses. And then um, the, um, well, I guess that's the two we got. Um, any questions on that? No. No, no, no ma'am. 
Um, so our Union Pacific Grant Award was 3000 and we partnered with Christy at the CVB, and she put in 2000 So we had that money to produce those videos to do the uh, um, um, ticket to shop promotion, the prizes, and all that type of stuff. So economic development remained steady while we were through COVID. I mean, I have people nearly every week, every couple of weeks, calling, walking in, wanting to know, have more information. So from the quarterly reports that I maintain for Kansas Main Street, um, I have a minimum of $5,937 that uh, amounted to renovations, building purchases, public investment from the city, et cetera. Um, you know, we had some new businesses. Um, some of them came in the end of 19. Um, most of them in 2020 that you can see there. Uh, Petra's Embus, the food truck, came in in 2020 as well. Um, several businesses expanded, which is always good. Uh, Island Spice, he was off in um, on deployment somewhere, so they were closed for a little while. And the Saint Sushi is the family bistro that changed their name. Mm -hmm. Um a few closings, MJ Chow Hall and the First City Wine and Spirits closed, I would say, in March, yeah. right when the pandemic hit. Um, but for the most part, um, most everybody remained. Kansas Embroidery um, left towards the end of the year. Her husband has been really sick and has since passed away. But she will still be part of Main Street um, and be coming back, not as a storefront. So our, um, just to let you know, I... Uh, count the buildings um, that are available to lease or to purchase and we have about 221 buildings downtown wow. that are storefront or storefront compatible that doesn't include City Hall and the two hotels and IMAC and stove lofts and those type of things but um, when I just did my um, available properties, we have 15 storefronts that are for lease. Okay. We have seven empty buildings that are for sale. We have six buildings that are for sale, although they have tenants in the storefronts. So all in all, that's uh, um, only about 22 locations that are either empty or for sale. And you know, we have a couple big ones like the Lee's building, like the Club Venom. Right. Um, and uh, so I think all in all, and we have new folks coming in. Um, let's see. We have a microbrewery coming in. They purchased a building. Hmm. We have a distillery coming in. That's oh, exciting. So nice. We have uh, at least one new eatery, possibly two coming in. A boutique is looking at a building to purchase. So, you know, it's, it's promising. Have anybody uh, inquired about the, the Lee's Furniture Building recently? Do you know that answer, Lori? And we showed it a week or two ago. Okay. Um, can, you, can you come up or go to or, the podium? Yeah. The Lori's show. with uh, Cole yeah. Banker, Riley's. Yeah, so people can hear you. The podium is great. Thank you. And just, All right. and just state your name. Hi, I'm Lori Medford. Uh, I'm a realtor, and I'm on the board for Main Street. Um, we have, we have shown it once the the building. Um, I think I, it it does need quite a bit of work on the inside. So it's that's that's kind of a obstacle that's that people that are looking to purchase are having to work through. It's we have noticed that with commercial buildings that it's not. People don't just quickly buy a building. They yeah. have to do a lot of research and yeah, I gotcha. figure out. And it's a large, yeah, large yeah. building. Right. Was the person or people who were looking from within our local area, or were they from out of state, or? Uh, he's close by. Okay. Um, and from what I understood, he's kind of wanting to look at it as an event space. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's a really nice building. It's just it's. Got a lot of deferred maintenance. Okay. It, it's an historical building, right? And, uh, it's not listed on oh, the okay. um, downtown um, okay. list. 
I think uh, probably because it had the Iron Curtain on it when they did the um, designations back before I was here. Okay. And so hopefully, um, you know, I've asked uh, planning if, if they could apply to do a new um, review of downtown properties. I'm not sure since John put those replacement windows in that oh. aren't historic, it may not qualify. But no, you'd think it is, but it isn't. When were those windows put in? After he took the iron curtain off, okay. uh, four years probably. Four years okay. ago, probably. It looks a little better, I think, maybe because they had these kind of ratty-looking shades that were there, and I think since it's up for sale, they've taken those kind of shades down. It looks better, not great, but I think a little bit better. Well, we encourage building owners to, um, you know, wash the windows, yep. make them presentable, right. but you know as well as I do, we have many that are downtown <laughs> that they're working on them or whatever, and they look pretty bad. But yes, when Riley listed it, I think they pulled some of that yep, plastic did. down, and they it did. looks a little bit yeah, better. And it is, it, is, it is a three-story building, but the third floor is, you can't get up there. The flooring is mm -hmm. kind of... And it has a full basement, too. Yeah. Is, is that it, still uh, today? Is that still usable? The basement. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I just remember from no I mean, the furniture days. You know, well, it, say, it, yeah, it's a elevator? lot of things down there downstairs. There is an elevator that I mean. Yeah, it has an elevator. Uh, back. Probably a furniture yeah. elevator. Yeah. It's a freight elevator. Yeah. I've yeah. taken yeah. it before. It's not super scary, but. So it's um, right in that door on Cherokee, right at the west mm -hmm. end of the building, that big door that. Okay. So, you know, it only takes thank one person well, thank to you. buy it. We'll uh, continue to um, reach out to out-of-town folks. It's within the opportunity zones as well. Uh, Jade Everett Transfers is on the market. There's not a sign in the building yet, but Riley has that. And uh, it's a lot more expensive. It's a lot more of a building. Right. Um, and so um, those are, you know, pretty big, high-dollar Plus the renovation. I'm not sure in the other, besides the first three floors of the wards building or Crancers, what those floors look like. I've never been up there. Anybody been up there on those? Above three? Uh, uh -huh. No, I don't think he has anything. It used to be some offices. But well, I think his offices are on three, and then the lounge is on two, and the event center is right. on one. But above that, I don't think he's ever And I used don't believe. Well, I can't imagine Wards didn't have an elevator, but I don't know that there's a working elevator in that building. There uh, never was when we did events and had to get people from the first floor to the lounge. It does have an. It did have an elevator in the back that uh -huh. was up in the alley, but it's yep. non-workable. Yep. So I've had events there, and we wanted for ADA, and uh, that would be the only way. And the elevator does not function, so mm -hmm. it's a tough ADA compliant building. When you say it's for sale, the building's for sale, is the business still active right now? I know there's not many events going on. But. You know, Kat, um, Kat was the um, event gal. She owns the um, a restaurant in Weston. I can't answer that. I haven't talked to her for a while. They haven't had much going on. They, I don't think they've been on, open on Thursday evenings. Not sure. No. So uh, I'm not aware of any events that have gone on yeah. in 2020. Um, you know, beautiful location, beautiful yeah. second floor, first floor, um, lots of potential. Uh, so I'm confident that something will happen in that uh, space. space. Right. Um, and I can send you, I maintain this available properties list. If you'd like me to send the PDF, I can send that on, or Carlin can send it on. I didn't make a copy of all those. Um, sometimes it looks like a lot because they're categorized and green is upper story and not storefront on this list. Red is for sale and black is for lease. So this is an invaluable document that I send out to everybody along with the funding opportunities. Um, let's see. We are really working on upper story development. We know how important it is. Kansas Main Street just announced a a grant opportunity we'll be applying for. They're kind of relatively small opportunities because they're competitive and they're within the other Main Street communities. But, um, you know, um, Ken Bateman put, Bateman put two um, beautiful lofts in his building at 618, and we finished our loft at 416. Island Spice plans to move downtown. Um, 
his personal uh, residence mm -hmm. and is working on that space. We've got a number of them ready to start. So we've talked to Kansas Main Street and to Secretary Tolan and let him know that foundations now are funding larger amounts to fewer projects because that infusion of a larger amount makes a lot more sense. But that may not happen. We'll keep talking about that. And maybe, you know, it'll just be a few communities. But right now it's competitive and they're about $6,000 um, grant opportunities. We... Um, we have about 65 upper story lofts that include um, storefront apartments, those two of Carol Blackwell's, mm -hmm. but they don't include like the stove factory loft or the high rises, um, some of those type of things. So that's quite a few in our downtown. Um, some have been renovated, some have not. Mm, it's about the same. So these are some of Ken Bateman's, okay. um, his new lofts. Are those rented yet? Yep, okay. rented immediately. Yep. Yeah, I've yeah. heard those before. Yeah, they're very nice. And they're beautiful. Um, <clears throat> this is the Main Street loft that we got done with, and we rented it pretty much immediately to a young military uh, permanent party, I think. He mm -hmm. works at the USDB. And, so anyway, um, certainly a, a great addition to downtown. We use this as a tax credit project. Um, that's a big process that I did on my spare time, but you know it was worth it to show folks that they could go ahead and work on a tax credit project and can use tax credits as well. This is some early photos of the Island Spice upstairs. It's pretty cool. I don't know how much of the historic features will remain, but... Um, that's exciting when I get to go into those uh, locations. This was uh, Channel 5. Uh, Nathan Vickers came out and did an article on um, Lee Kaufman, our muralist, and then it talks about her studio. Do you want to see that one? Did you watch that one? How long is it, Wendy? I don't think it's too long. Uh, we can stop it at any time. Can you start that one? It's always nice when a, a large channel reaches out to us and wants to do something mm -hmm. instead of us having to reach out to them and Definitely. usually don't get a response. Oh, there's a couple commercials too. I don't know if we can go past those. No, maybe not. Challenge yourself to the career you want. Challenge accepted. Purdue University Global. Affordable online education for driven working adults. <laughs> about art. Creativity takes courage. And during the COVID recession, it may take more courage than normal to create. Our Nathan Vickers shows us some work that was put on hold when the pandemic began and explains what it's like for artists picking up the brush again. The color palette of the rising sun inspires creativity. But for Lee Kaufman, I am not a morning person. Starting at dawn is a practical matter. Okay, try to get out there early because otherwise it gets too hot. A hundred year old building in downtown Leavenworth is a difficult canvas. It's a much rougher surface. The heat of the day doesn't help. If it gets too hot, the paint's not going to stick real good to the walls and maybe possibly come off later. She wanted to be finishing up this project for the Main Street program back in the spring. The pandemic set it back. Then I got permission from the city to come out and go ahead and, and start painting again. Then there was the gallery she opened in Tonganoxie, featuring her work alongside other local painters like Kathy Brackheisen. Art is music for the soul. It's just something that we all need for happiness. It takes us into a dream world. Businesses like this one went on hold, too. I was open for two months and then had to close for the coronavirus. For many artists, it was a new opportunity. With all this home time, I had nothing to do but sit and paint and paint and paint some more. <laughs> a lot of creativity in the head. The head was very busy. Now the small town shop is open once again. And our galleries are safe place to go because you don't touch anything. And Kaufman's brush has found its stroke. The whole idea about 
do an art for me is that people see it and it, it makes them happy. Soon the stories of Lewis and Clark, the railroads, and the Buffalo soldiers will greet visitors driving by Lady Shine's office. It is tremendous. We are so excited. A sign the town is recovering too. We feel like a lot more added public art will only showcase Leavenworth better and bring more people here. Art finds a way. Artists shouldn't be afraid to get it out there. As long as those with the passion are there. I just love what I do. To add color to the world. In Leavenworth, Nathan Vickers, KCTV 5 News. Thank you for yes. thank you for showing that. Uh, Lee Hoffman is an ama amazing artist, and that is a a tremendous creation, I think, and uh, catches everybody's eye as they travel through our downtown. And, uh, and it's a piece of artwork because she used um, a little bit of spray paint, but most of it was um, brushes and paint. And um, I'd have to hold up these big sections of paper that she'd drawn on, and she'd sketch those out. And she's uh, visiting with a couple other folks in Leavenworth downtown to do murals for them. Oh, nice. So that's nice. exciting. Nice. Uh, and we lucked out having yep. her do our mural. Mm -hmm. um, we continue with our incentive with without walls, and um, um, it, it helps a little bit. Uh, the maximum we can loan is uh, at no interest is twenty thousand, and they provide sixty thousand match. So we look at those projects. Um, and who is they? The state or? Or, or, um, well, um, before Kansas Main Street was reinstated, we were able to keep our IWW money, that's money that's Department right, of Commerce money. Right, right. So now that they're there, I would imagine they'll review our loans. Um, in the interim, when we didn't have Kansas Main Street, our board would review the loans. Okay. I would write those applications, and they would review those. So Karma has a loan. Um, Dr. Kristen, Kristen at Life Family Chiropractic has a loan. Kay, at, she's a therapist, has a loan. Um, Tenpenny has had loans. Many of them have had loans. Kansas Country, um, Gronus. So we've had a long history of helping out a lot of uh, businesses. Um, we are, uh, you know, a partner with the city. We appreciate the things that we do, and we hope that you appreciate those community business benefit projects that we're doing, the uh, veterans banners on Delaware, the American flags that we put up. Um, we couldn't do the reception this year. Um, in 2020, we went ahead with the 5K history walking trail, and that starts at Haymarket. So I really encourage you to take that bits and pieces of the whole thing. It's amazing, all of the histories that are on. They're posted on the building, so you start at the Haymarket and go towards the water department, and it leads you down Cherokee, back up Delaware, down Shawnee, and there's 131 signs, uh, great history of buildings and the town. We did a Shawnee Art Walk and um, showcased that, I believe, in 2019. And then we added um, some signage on our um, message boards. We renovated the message boards. So, um, you know, those are more public art things. Um, the pole banner project, the ones that are out and about and are sponsored by businesses, that's winding down. We've had a number of them, the brackets broken by trucks and it's been about four years. And so, and due to Evergy's size requirements, it really doesn't make sense to do those banners anymore because they've shortened them. They're um, only three foot, they used to be four foot. Uh, they have to be within a certain area on the pole and it's really hard to see those sponsors. So we'll come up with some other project. That's the banner of honor and the flags over Delaware. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a popular one. We, um, Marley manages that and uh, we always have a waiting list. This was the uh, First City Passageways. We were gonna do it in June last year, but we had to put it off. So come September, October-ish, we did that. And those are the um, unique kind of um, underutilized doorways, windows that were around town. And so Nancy Bowder won first place and Amy Mann at Tom and Ann's won second and Alan Collins won third. And we had, I believe, eight artists. And so we hope, we plan to bring that project back in June. So you can see the befores and the after. Um, there's our mural and Lee signing it and we had a dedication, uh, little mini party there in the parking lot.
<clears throat> Here's the History 101 uh, starting trail, and you can see that this is what our message boards look like on the right, and we had a volunteer refurbish them, so we've got a nice black banner around them, yellow tops, and at some point, uh, we don't have them on there. There's some graphics that go down the poles that will say 5K History Walking Trail, but they're not there yet. How many message boards are, are downtown? Probably. We have seven, I believe. Oh, seven. Okay. So our intent this year, we need to change our Shawnee Art Walk because we realize that um, one of the histories that we, you know, was a professional history we got off of the Internet isn't exactly right. So we're going to change that. And then there were kind of some arrows on our brochure, and it almost led people to think, oh, I go this way to see that one. And that isn't right. So anyway, we're getting ready to do two new Art Walk signs, and we'll do some other fun signs that recognize the Three Mile Creek Trail, the, the message board that's down at Haymarket. Uh, we have a couple, you've probably seen that caricature map that's always in the shopper that the Times does. So we're going to do some fun maps like that that showcase downtown, shop local, eat local, that type of thing. So those are coming in 2021. Um, this is the new banner uh, that will be in the municipal parking lots. Uh, we're uh, in the process of making those. So that'll add a lot more color downtown. Will they, will they be at the entrance to the parking lot? They'll or? be on the poles that are within, usually in the islands. Okay. So we've done a map. Um, I don't remember how many. There's quite a few. It's an expensive project. They'll be double-sided. Uh, and and how did you say how many or no? You, you know, I didn't look that up since that's a 2021 project. But oh, it's that's a, okay. Yeah, it's it's quite a few. I'm going to say 40 some. some? Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, let's see. These are economic impact events that, you know, all businesses can do. Sometimes they're um, for Main Street businesses, but we found that the getting back on track was really popular. We did well with the um, Shop Small Saturday and Christmas in July events. Um, the rocking around the Christmas tree was great. And then the infusion of the Unified District 453, 31,250 Main Street bucks the week of Christmas was awesome. The merchants just continue to tell me how fabulous that was. They continue to come in. We're way past the 12,005 that have been redeemed. We're probably at 13,005 from when I put this together. But it just shows how important, you know, local businesses, local entities investing in uh, the merchants um, is amazing. So this was our rocking around the Christmas tree, some of our winners. Uh, we had a number, a, week, a weekly drawing, and we partnered with uh, Christy at the CVB. These are the activities that uh, we do, and many of them were canceled. Um, and we don't want to forget our tried and true merchants, because they're our anchors, and they're the ones that have been around through good times and bad. Sometimes we only talk about those new businesses, but we've got a lot of tried and true merchants that are there and you know they exist they're the key to success downtown and we need them and they need us it's a tremendous um, revenue source downtown from the many merchants so i encourage you to go in um get to know them they're they're fun they're pretty amazing you know these are uh certainly the club venom building is a thorn in our side and i'll visit more with paul and Taylor on that one. Um, the lease furniture, you know, it's come down to a little bit more of a reasonable price. I think it's six hundred fifty or five hundred fifty thousand. So we'll um, continue to reach out to folks. Um, the thing we found during COVID is that many folks, which we encourage them to use the internet, they started doing Facebook Lives, and they're very successful for them, which is great but they've decided that there's no way they're going to be open six days a week anymore. So as we have folks come visit our beautiful downtown, I'll drive by and there'll be, you know, a mom and a daughter or something. It's like, well, it's closed. <laughs> Monday isn't a very open day downtown. And so many of them shortened their hours. We're hoping that they will go back. We continue to talk about you have to be open consumer hours, and consumer hours aren't 10 to 5. So we're continuing on that tangent, but 
it, it changes so many things with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we right. know that many shopped online, Amazon, all of those mm -hmm. types of things. But, um, like I said, we need them and they need us. And we have an exciting downtown. Let's see. These are our awards. Can we play that? Um, it's that one, the next one. Oops. Oops. Sure. I got to yeah. go through all of them. Yeah, because this was on Facebook as well, wasn't it? The one? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, it was on our Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Cause, yeah. No, so nice. we had to it's do nice. our annual banquet um, virtually this year, and we were fortunate to have uh, Brenda Darley, uh, a local resident, a KU student, do put together our video. So it's bits and pieces from board meetings, and then we went up to um, Secretary Tolan's office and... Uh, awarded him award an award because he did, was so instrumental in promoting Kansas Main Street and doing everything he could to um, for our Kansas Main Streets. And uh, <clears throat> the video really does show up and bigger when you watch it somewhere else. So in closing, I handed out a few things. These are the businesses that are in downtown Leavenworth categorized, um, updated for your information. Um, we do keep up our shopping and dining guide. This is the bigger one. This is the business guide. Um, these are Main Street investors. And on the back of the shopping and dining guide, you'll notice the, well, both of them have the calendar of events. But on the shopping and dining, it starts with March. We did events in January and February, but we didn't have enough room to keep those on here. So we've added several new events. We have a spring open house that's um, March 26th and 27th. we have uh, starting a Main Street Marketplace, which will be held first Saturdays at the Haymarket Event Center, and that will help showcase some home-based businesses and those that aren't in the downtown district. Um, we have a spring fling beginning that's similar to the uh, rocking around the Christmas tree promotion where they spend money, they'll get a stamp and we'll do drawings. That is March 15th through May 15th. Um, because we haven't been able to have our very popular spring tea last year or this year, we're doing a tour to tea tables, which is a free event for any business, even outside of the downtown. 
They will decorate a beautiful tea table in their business. Folks will get a map, a free map. They can go around and view those and um, um, vote on them, first, second, third, maybe a few more places. Um, we will have some silent auction type baskets that are part of that promotion, but we want to keep that in the mind's eye. So hopefully 22, 2022, we can have that go on. So um, anyway, the business brochure hasn't been updated with the new events, but we always do that on the back. Merchants have those. We hand those out a lot. So Thursday evening is our very popular International Beer Fest. Um, you go around to 18 plus businesses, uh, two ounce or less sample of an international beer, a nice tasty thing. You don't need dinner that night. It's a fun event. People social distance. They have their mask on. They're careful if there's a group in of six or eight inside. They wait. So that's a, a very fun event. Spring Open House is just, uh, we'll have some different activities downtown. Um, it's whatever the merchants want to do. It's not real structured. April is an Alive After Five on April 1st, and uh, it's, a, it's an art crawl. So we'll have lots of different art featured in the different businesses. So those are well worth the $15 ticket. Um, and I think that's all I have right now. I thank you for your time. Um, yeah, I have, any questions? Yeah, <laughs> I do. Uh, Mrs. Scheidt, uh, have you lost any uh, this year, I guess, or lost any memberships or renewals as of this year from businesses? Would oh, we say? always lose a few. We've lost um, probably uh, one that I know of due to the mask issue. Okay. <laughs> Some are very strong either way. Right. They haven't come out and told us, but we feel like that's probably what the issue is. But, um, but not more than any usual year, would no. you say? So it didn't really... No, we're usually pretty consistent sure. around that 130, 140-ish okay. type. We're, uh, the end of February, we requested most of our renewals come in. We have some um, quarterly members that pay quarterly, so um, some haven't paid their first quarter dues. But yeah, we're we're pretty consistent with what we do. Right. Um, okay. And then, um, did you uh, during this whole pandemic time, and I know it's still ongoing, but even starting last year, did you reach out to any other Main Street organizations just to see how they were? Dealing with their downtowns or oh, good yeah. ideas. Oh yeah, we had several, um, you know, group Zoom calls, uh -huh. team calls. I think the state uses, and so we were all on those and learning different um, tactics to use to help our small businesses. Yeah, we all talk together. Okay. Well, yeah, no, um, I just have one more thing, and then I'll pass it around to the commissioners. But no, I want to commend you and your staff and your board through this whole time period. I mean, the start of ever the shutdown and everything. Uh, my goodness, you guys just kept on working and kept seeing what can we do, how can we help, uh, how can we help businesses and keep this community together for downtown. Mm -hmm. I mean, that shows, and that shows how much you care and how much your board cares, and the down care, downtown businesses care for each other. So I thank you very much for yeah. that. Well, we reached out to folks that weren't Main Street investors. You know, I would personally text if I know they don't look at an email. I'd call, I'd go in, whatever, you know, to try and say, hey, have you taken advantage of this city opportunity or this state or this federal opportunity? There's always different circumstances, and I can't force them to do it, but uh, many did. Right. And so, and I'm understanding that the higher grants have been um, forgiven, the loans. So that's a cool deal for some restaurants. We had four restaurants downtown that received that early on. Oh, good, good. So, um, okay. you know, some were hesitant. They went ahead and applied, but they put that money in a separate account, didn't want to touch it in case they had to pay it back. But it was um, granted in the end. Okay. So, anyway. thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, did you have anything? Uh, good presentation. No other comments. Thank you. Uh, two questions, Ms. Wright. You, uh, you listed seven business closings. Uh, I'm just, any of them, in your opinion, directly related to the pandemic. I'm thinking MJ Chow Hall. They opened at just, I don't want to say a terrible time, but they opened in They did, and, you know, I think they were trying to carry on when Stretch pulled out, and I think they had worked for him. 
And it just wasn't, you know, I think they just thought, hey. Well, do you think the pandemic uh, closed? I think clo ha them definitely. having to close. But the other, the other ones listed, any of them related to the pandemic? You know, you I think know we're closed for, a lot of non-essentials are closed for, what, about 60 days? Uh, yep. April through 1st of June, somewhere in there. Well, like the uh, First City Wine and Spirits, I thought, well, goodness, the liquor stores are doing a heck of a yeah. business. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, maybe because of their location, they're getting ready to reopen in another location. Right. Yeah, they are. Um, and uh, Pullman closed temporarily, sure. totally. Well, restaurants hit. Uh, that was the, uh, yeah. wasn't that the But they could mandate? do carry out oh, yeah. or they yeah. could do delivery so all of I think all of most all of the other ones mm -hmm. did carry out yeah. right and you know even delivered you know their own delivery services so um they were but, delivering on post too weren't they yep, for multiple yep, yeah. yep they were doing everything they could it was amazing to watch them just like they were the ever so, ready bunnies so once again the question uh, you don't think any of them closed necessarily for the pandemic besides maybe MJ Chow Hall may have hit them the hardest because of their timing of their opening. I think that probably hit them the hardest yeah. because that was a large space. Um, and I have just one other question. Uh, obviously, we put in a mask ordinance. Put one in in November. We put one in in January through the end of March. You know, there, there's people on both sides of the, uh, of the question. One of the things that we heard, and I just haven't seen any evidence of it, but I'm wondering if you have, how has that either negatively, negatively or positively affected businesses? Well, you know, we will hear those that really don't want to wear a mask, and the owners will ask them, will you please put a mask on, before the mandate was in place, because they, you know, wanted to be open. Right. Number one, they don't want to have to close down. And, you know, they would have some that uh, one restaurant I know was having folks sign in with their phone number and people didn't want to do that and uh, for the contact tracing. And no, I'm they, asking about the mask, not about contact okay. tracing. Okay. Um, so they either walk out of the business or they go ahead and come in and, and the owner doesn't push the issue. Okay. And you're probably in touch with a lot of businesses that surround Leavenworth County. It, you know, it's one of the things you've heard, so we'll never shop in Leavenworth again, we'll go down the road, but can, are there any places, really, that you can, during the mask mandate time, ordinance times in various cities and counties, is there really any place within 50 miles of here that you could shop without masks that you know Online. of? Online. <laughs> no, yeah, I know, yeah. I, I know that. Yeah, in your yeah, house. I mean, throw those yeah. sales. I'm not aware, um, you know, we're probably the biggest community. Oh, uh, legends, um, the legends. Right there. Well. In Kansas City, Missouri, yeah. Johnson County, yeah. Um, okay, I just wanted, because I yeah, hear that, so this, is, this will kill our business, and I, I can see closing of a business mm -hmm. can do it, but wearing a mask, I, I, in these times, if we're the only place in the United States of America that mm -hmm. did it, I think it'd be a little bit odd. But if we're with everyone else, I, I just have not seen how that's had a negative effect. The pandemic as a whole has, mm -hmm. obviously, Amazon's mm -hmm. doing land office business, but uh, the other ones. Well, okay. we continue to say, you know, nobody really likes wearing masks, but if it keeps us open, if it keeps the businesses open, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. We've got to be open. They can't do anything. They can't stay in business if they can't be open. No. It's really difficult. I guess they could do some online sales, but that won't hold Yeah, that's over. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commissioner um, Ms. Scheidt, you mentioned four or five businesses that had gotten the loans. Were those the loans available through the Paycheck Protection Program? Were, the, were those those well, loans? Well, the higher were, were just for restaurants. Right. But then I, later on, you, I think your organization plus LCDC did a good job in terms of being an information broker, in terms of getting the word out to our businesses that these uh, Paycheck Protection Program loans, yep. uh, which have become for, forgivable and were low interest to begin with, I think they were you know, like a 1% interest rate. And uh, I appreciate that and was aware of that because I was having these, um, you know, le uh, you know, mayors, town halls, and we would talk about that just to get the word out. And I know our banking community, both within the city and the county, did a great job working with their businesses to to get to get these loans. And just for the city, 
the total amount that was loaned through that program was uh, approximately $9 million. There were 294 total loans to businesses, which included, you know, your typical small business, um, but nonprofits or not-for-profit organizations, sole proprietorships and LLCs, and that the total retained jobs were about 1,500, 1,500 uh, jobs that were retained. So that was a program that uh, you and the LCDC supported just in terms of reaching out to your partners and including the city. And uh, I just want to thank you for that and Marley and, and your investors. Yep. We, um, you know, pushed for that CDBG money since we're an entitled city. I don't know if that's a proper term, but, right. you know, and that finally came through. I know there were a lot of hoops the city had to go through. Um, the PPP, the first round, really wasn't for uh, folks that were the only, they weren't even employees, they were owners. So that was kind of difficult. I believe it finally opened up to where um, if you were an owner, you could apply for that. Right. And um, then the city relief grant, that was popular, and I hope that that went over well. I haven't touched base with Taylor mm -hmm. lately, but, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a <laughs> they're all different. Um, you know, some, a husband might own the, biz, the building, and the other spouse pays rent to that, and that's a different combination. Some have bank loans, some don't. Um, some have a few employees, some it's only themselves. So it's, it's just a mixed bag of how they operate their businesses. And uh, I think everything that, that, you know, the ones that really hopped on those opportunities quickly generally got funded. But it was pretty quick, the money went fast. Yeah. But there, I think we are in the second round of these uh, small business administration PPP loans, mm -hmm. uh, if yep. I'm not mistaken. So, yep. mm -hmm. if you're continuing to get the word out about that, that would be that would be great. Yep. Thank you. you know, okay. that's our that's our passion and and mission to keep them in business. We only you know are in business because they're in business. Right. right. But okay. Well, thank thank you very much. It was a great report, yeah, Mrs. Shite. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. As always. Yep. Call on uh, Marley or I, anything you need, and uh, we'll uh, continue to move forward. Okay, thank <laughs> it's you. It's a big thank time. It How is. can That's it be more respected already? I know. <laughs> okay, uh, number three on the study session is Police Department 2020 Annual Report, Chief Pat Kitchens. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, Commission. Thank you very much for having us tonight. I'm here representing the men and women of the Police Department to present to you the 2020 Annual Report. Um, before I begin, the first statistic I wanted to report is the number four, which is how many kennels are in the animal control van that I did not know two weeks ago. <laughs> but Mayor Bowder is not here, so if you're out there, man, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'll tell him. Um, four. Four. Um, okay. Hopefully she's watching. Right. She, yeah, she probably is. Again, I'm here to present the uh, 2020 annual report from the police department. For many, many years, the police department has prepared a report that tries to give a general sense to the community and to the elected officials about the ongoings of crime and traffic and animal issues that happen over the course of the year. We collect a massive amount of data and a ton of data. Not all of it is contained in the report. If it was, it would be a phone book and be really difficult to follow. You'd be bored to death. So this really just kind of encapsulates those common elements that we try and deal with every year and answer those questions. But if at some point um, there's something else you want to know, we're certainly easily, easily able to provide that to you. The other part before I begin that I'd like to talk about is that this only tells half the story. Uh, data can um, be represented in many different ways, but as important as the information contained in the report, it's how people feel about the community. I feel very strongly about trying to get a sense of that. No matter what this data says to you, um, it may reflect positive stuff, which I'll talk about, but if you were the victim of a crime last year, uh, these numbers really don't mean a whole lot to you. You might not feel as safe. And as I go about my day and I talk to people and I, and I sense and gauge uh, how they're doing, that's as important to me as any information that we have here. So let's get started. I'll uh, do that, ask any questions. I don't have any videos for you to look at. Uh, you probably wouldn't be able to look at ours anyway. Um, let's see. All right. That way. All right. So that's the organizational chart. Um, if you had any questions uh, about that. 
Uh, let's start a little bit my message. Obviously, last year was a very difficult year for everybody, including the police department with the pandemic stuff. We had um, civil unrest, high profile police incidents, a pretty contentious presidential election, and we were pretty, pretty involved in most of those things. Um, but by and large, uh, very proud of the men and women of the police department. Um, as a general sense, I would share with you that the crime rate overall in the city of Lemworth dropped by 11% last year. Uh, that's the second year in a row that we've seen a fairly significant drop in the crime rate. Um, awesome. And I'll get into the details of that. Um, uh, nothing really has changed in terms of our resource allocation. The principal uh, issues that we deal with are domestic violence, mental illness, uh, drug cases, traffic issues, animal control issues, those things. Um, are something that uh, require a great deal of our attention and, and we continue to do the best that we can to allocate that. Um, so let's get started talking about a little bit of data. The police department in general, we are allocated 61 positions. We stand at eight vacancies right now. We've averaged that number about seven over the last few years. That is common in the law enforcement profession. Almost all law enforcement agencies across the United States are dealing with hiring, retaining, and uh, attracting candidates to come to the police department. But we still, um, this week we're uh, involved in a hiring process. They're interviewing eight candidates for officer positions uh, tomorrow and Thursday, so we'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully uh, that group will produce some candidates and we'll get some people hired and keep, uh, keep that get that number down for us as we move through the rest of the year. When you say that, who are they in terms of the interview? So yeah, so we have um, the hiring process is quite extensive. It's about three or four months. So they, these candidates have taken both the PT test and the written test and passed them. Okay. They've also passed the preliminary criminal history check that would automatically eliminate them. So these eight candidates we have left have um, you know gotten over a pretty significant hurdle. And then so there's a panel of uh, staff members that interview them. Um, and then uh, we'll make, uh, make some sense about whether we feel like they uh, should advance in the process. And then there's several other stages in the process. And so they're probably about a third of the way through that. Who has, this, who has that panel? Do you, do you rotate it among your more senior officers, or is it the deputy chief? Yes. So uh, there's actually a two-stage interview process. There's a panel of about somewhere from three to five, depending on what the schedules are. But I have a, the patrol lieutenant who is, uh, would be in charge of all the uniformed officers. I have a sergeant that's the administrative sergeant. He handles all of the you know, application process and the recruiting and retention. And then there's typically one or two other sergeant senior people that conduct those interviews. Um, and if they pass that, then they are sent to me and the deputy chief when we do a second smaller interview. I got it. Okay? Thank you. So what continues to affect my hairline adversely <laughs> is, oh, what I do, Taylor? Did I turn it off? Sorry, I was looking for the red dot thing. Forget it. I'm out. <laughs> that number right there, the blue chunk right there that says 37%, mm -hmm. that represents uh, the number of uh, those officers have been here for two years or less. And so they have a tremendous amount of energy, a good attitude and good morale, but they don't have a lot of experience. And so they're out there doing the best they can, getting through those growing pain stages. It probably takes about three years really till you get completely comfortable. And so... Um, I lose a little bit of my hairline once, uh, once a week or once a month with one of the young kids. Doing a great job, great attitude, just young and inexperienced. And so we have to work our way through that uh, occasionally. Um, but otherwise, pretty happy generally with how things are progressing there. What's the average age, Chief? I don't know, like 21. That makes you old. I think that I think that group right there. I, I started before all those kids were born. That's how. Oh, um, that's how yeah. we're looking at. Um, they're they're typically about 25 years old or so. Uh, something like that, sir. You have to be 21 to join. So um, the last kid we hired turned 21 like a week before we hired her. So oh wow, we got that going. It's all exciting. The annual budget, um, you know, we have a little bit more than $7.8 million assigned to the police department, which is uh, very uh, generous and sufficiently funds the police department. Uh, one of the tenets of the police department is community engagement. I think you might recognize some of the characters in that video right there. Yes. Um, you know, we, we typically try and be out in the community a lot. Obviously, last year we didn't nearly do as much as we would want to do, but uh, we're looking forward to maybe getting back to some normalcy of that, trying to get some things uh, on the schedule to get back to do some things like that. Um, that, that is probably the most adverse effect we've had is our ability to go out and engage with the community and groups and sessions and that sort of thing. 
we did a few things. Um, we did our uh, trust talks. We did a couple of use of force forums, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We participated in the unity walk, that sort of thing. But boy, after that, we really got to the crunch, and, and it was tough to try to continue that sort of thing. So calls for service. So here's where we start to talk about a little bit of the data. A call for service is defined by any time the public calls us for any assistance in whatever uh, means they might call us. They're, they had a crime. There's an emergency. Uh, there's a traffic accident, there's an animal call, something like that. If they call us, we count it as a call for service. You will see that our numbers dipped down there um, by a little bit last year. Um, some of that is associated with COVID. So uh, we had typically been responding to an EMS call. A guy fell off a ladder. We would go there and support them. When the pandemic issues started, we really scaled back and tried to decide whether we actually really needed to be there. EMS and the fire department are perfectly capable of handling those things. So reduce our exposure to the pandemic issues. We clamped down on some of the calls that we might otherwise go as a support position. We didn't do those things, um, and we felt like that had some value to it. Um, but otherwise, uh, those numbers kind of came, came down a little bit. In terms of dealing with the COVID, people were still calling us. We just triaged it a little differently. Instead of going there, we might have called them on the phone and worked out a police report situation that way. They were emailing us information and that sort of thing, and that helped us reduce the exposure to us and them uh, relative to calls for service. Okay? Okay. Part one and part two crimes. So part one crimes I'll get to in a minute. Those are the seven big ones. Part two crimes is everything else. Okay. Um, that's established by the FBI so we can all speak the same language when there's a theft here in California or New York or Florida or wherever, it's all the same thing. Okay, So you could see uh, the Part 1 crimes took a pretty significant drop. and uh, I'm sorry, the Part 1 crimes took a tiny drop, but the Part 2 crimes took a pretty significant drop. Okay, um, And that's reflective of that. But I like the trend in the last couple, three years where we see some net downward trending of those, of those data points. Criminal activity, we try and break it down into every conceivable way, part of the, where it happened at, what time it happened at, all of the things that um, we collect, we sort of put it in a map. Don't be fooled by Area 2. Uh, that's where the uh, jail is, I think. So someone, uh, there's a little bit more arrest activity right there. Uh, someone uh, gets stopped for a traffic stop and they go to jail for a DUI or something like that. We discover they have a warrant that arrest would count as a location at the jail. So those numbers are typically higher just because that's where the jail is, okay? Um, but you will see um, <clears throat> we had uh, in area one, we had one homicide, uh, rape calls, robberies, assaults, all of the sort of very serious crimes. We, that's the part one crimes that we're talking about. And those are all broken down by part of the community. That's a map on the left and our patrol zones, if you have any questions about that. Uh, we broke that out to a 10-year trend. I don't like to look at one year and make a determinate decision about whether that uh, it, you know, is impactful. We kind of take a longer viewpoint. And again, the last few years, uh, we've seen a little bit of a downward trend right there. Okay? Mm -hmm. Statistically, that probably you know, kind of goes up and down a little bit, but um, we try and look at, a, at the biggest possible uh, scenario we had. This year in the city of Lemworth, we had three homicides. That's pretty high for us. We typically don't have that. Um, the one out on 13th Street Terrace was uh, associated with a drug case. Uh, mm -hmm. The one up north in the community was a domestic violence incident. And then the one that we're still working on on Eisenhower was a dispute that actually started in Lansing and then ended up right there on Eisenhower. We're still working on that. I'm very uh, um, happy with the progress of that investigation. We've had a lot of conversations with Mr. Thompson's office, and we uh, continue to be hopeful that at some point we'll uh, proceed with charges on that. Hey, Chief, I do have a question on that chart. Yes, sir. Um, and I understand about the homicides, and obviously I agree with you. But what struck me was um, from 2017 to 2018, we saw a pretty significant increase in the number of rapes um, and then or rape cases. And then um, th that's kind of maintained um, a consistency in 2019 and 2020. Any, I mean, what, I, I just going from 37 and 2017 to 57 and 2018, obviously a very violent um, and uh, concerning crime. Any, any, any so uh, ins I, insights I usually, on that? I usually answer all these questions by starting globally. You probably have seen uh, in some of the news clips in the areas across the community about the issue of 
DNA test kits and some agencies not sending them in. Um, there's a lot of conversations in the criminal justice world about sexual assault and really advocating for reporting it. One of the dilemmas that we have with a sexual assault is a concern by the victim of reporting it. And so in the last three to five years in particular, there has been a really significant push by law enforcement and sexual assault survival advocates about reporting it. Okay. And so I would not be able to tell you definitively that we've had more, but certainly I would bet some of those are as a result of that campaign. I think we, uh, they come and ask for sexual assault awareness week and you know, that sort of thing okay. uh, where they're doing the proclamations and that kind of thing. We've really worked with like St. Mary's at the campus and those, those groups to really push that message out. We, you know, uh, we can't help if we don't know about it sure. and trying to overcome that burden. So I think that's some of it. There's been a lot of push of that in the last three or four years or so. That's sort of okay. uh, probably most of, that, uh, most of that. Thank you for that answer. Yes, sir. Again, we break property crimes down kind of the same way. You can see throughout the community where, when, what time, any, you know, any specific other questions. You know, we've got a lot of data about that. We just kind of map it out so folks can take a look at it. Um, and then property crimes, again, you see the big, you know, the big drop there with the property crimes going down the last few years. Um, and so uh, we're excited about that. One of the issues that we've had this year that really stand out as an anomaly is stolen automobiles. Mm -hmm. We have had a lot of stolen cars. Um, some of it is leaving their car open, some of it leaving the keys in, the folks that have the key fob now where you just push the button, that's a little bit of it. Um, we just constantly push a message out to the public to help us by helping you don't leave your car unlocked, um, that kind of stuff. That's been a lot. Um, is that primarily um, just at their house or is do you have a high risk, at, like if they're at a discount store or something like that, they leave them unlocked? Or? It's... Yeah, it's Leave all over running. the place, but yeah. principally at the house. You know, okay. principally at the house. That's what we're it's a, a large a large section. Um, we recover a lot of them. Um, it's a metro metropolitan wide issue. Someone steals a car in Lawrence, they drive it up here and leave it here and we recover it. Vice versa, someone steals a car here, they take it to Kansas City and Kansas City, Missouri recovers it, that kind of thing. So okay. there's a lot of theft being taken, but there is a pretty high recovery rate on the car, fortunately. Um, we just can't seem to get a grasp on that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, there's the specific numbers, and those are the specific crimes on the, on the left-hand column of that that specifically identified about what a part one crime is. Murder, robbery, rape, assault, burglary, theft, and auto theft. Those are part one crimes. Anything else that happens that's a crime is a part two crime. Okay? Okay. And those numbers tick down just a little bit by about 30, which is a, a good tra yeah. trajectory. But the trend overall has been good the last three right. or four years, right? Right. As far as the decrease in the Correct. number of reported part one crimes. Yes, sir. Clearance rates, uh, we're at about 53%. Um, that's a little bit higher than the national average. Part one, uh, part one crimes, particularly property crimes, are a little harder to solve. Stolen automobiles happen a lot. We, uh, it's very difficult to solve that. Again, it's a case where a car gets stolen here and left in Lawrence. It's very difficult to figure out, um, you know, who does that. Uh, so that, that number is always a little bit lower. The person crimes in part one crimes are certainly easier to solve because we know it's a person crime. You know, one person punches a guy in the face. Obviously, you know who that guy, most of the time you know who that guy is, right? So those are, that's how that sort of number looks a little bit lower. Part two crimes, again, a good trajectory that went down and down by quite a bit. So I'm very happy about that. And the clearance rates, again, are a little higher for that one because uh, those are just kind of everything all over the map about what a part two crime is. It's everything else. Okay. Happy about it. And then the overall clearance rate is 61%, which is in line with the national average. So about you know six out of 10 crimes that are committed, we're able to solve and identify and refer to prosecution or make an arrest of. Okay. Overall crime right there. Mental health, we deal with mental health a lot. Good news is that number is going down the last couple of years. Pretty happy about that. We're still going to one about every three days. It really takes a lot of resources to send to a mental health call because there's a lot of danger associated with it, especially if somebody might be armed and dealing with somebody that has substance abuse issues and that sort of thing. Um, if you might recall, 
Catalina Thompson and I came before you guys a few months back and we talked about the mental health diversion program. I wanted to follow up a little with you on that. Yes. I think they, uh, Catalina said they've screened about five people for that program out of City Court, but they've, uh, they've approved one person and that person is receiving services. So that program's off and running. Good, um, good. The criteria is pretty high, but it's good news that at least the one person, yeah. they're able to do that. And so just as a reminder, those folks are court required to go to the guidance center and take medication and that sort of thing, and that's, that's been helpful so far. So we're going to hopefully keep growing that program and make it a little bit more robust and help yeah. us out. Can I ask a question in terms of the downward trend over the last three years? Do we have, I mean, suicide prevention line? Um, do, we have any, do we have any idea what, you know, maybe behind the, you know, less yep. number of um, suicide calls over the last three years? Right. Um, Hard to really give you a tangible answer about that. It's kind of along the lines of the of the um, of the the awareness campaign. Yeah. Even at the national level, you see a lot of people, um, athletes and movie stars and mm -hmm. celebrities and politicians talking about the importance of mental health and mental health awareness, getting rid of the stigma of mental illness. And so, I believe that. And I, I'm hopeful that some folks are seeking help on their own, and it's not gotten to the point where we're at the point of a crisis where the police are responding and, and that sort of thing. Um, other than that, that might be a little COVID-related, too, yeah. fewer calls to the police, that sort of thing. Right. Um, you know, we'll see how that goes. But I'm, I'm very happy that over the last few years, that's dropped down pretty good. So okay. let's keep let's hope that keeps Thank up. Thank you. Yes. And, yeah, keep us posted on that program. Yes, ma'am. I sure will. Yeah. I sure will. We're yeah. off and running. That's yeah. only a few months old, so. Yeah, that's um, good. Detective Division. So you notice here the blue column represents cases assigned. I call this the ring doorbell effect, okay? Um, we saw some stuff earlier this week about ring doorbell cameras and security cameras. About half of the people now have some sort of either ring doorbell camera or security camera. So whereas before there would be a theft where we didn't have really any idea where to start or where to look, people are giving us a lot more videos. So we're assigning those cases more often, giving us a better opportunity at leads and following them up. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but um, I, that is as a result of um, that. And in addition to that, we have a, a one or two more uh, detective positions filled that we hadn't had for the last couple, couple years before that. So they're working more cases, which is all good news, which is all good stuff. How about the, uh, the, clear, the, I think the cleared percentage uh, was for 2020 was about 52%. The previous year was about 50%. Is that a, nationally, is that a good benchmark for, you know, a detective? Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're typically section. in line with the national average or maybe tight, slightly above it. And that also sort of depends on the crime, right? Yeah. Um, thefts are harder to solve than say, right. you know, a, a domestic violence case, we get there and everybody's there. So, you know, you know does that make sense, right? Um, so, uh, did that answer how, Yeah. How many det detectives do you have in the depart department? So we have a sergeant and eight detective positions and okay. we currently have seven of them filled. Okay. Right. All right. Okay. Arrests, arrests are down a little bit. This is directly tied to COVID. Uh, we made some internal procedural decisions about exposure to the officers, whether we really needed to make some arrest or not. Mm -hmm. If we pulled somebody over for speeding and they had a $100 ticket warrant that they didn't show up for court a month or two back, we just said, hey, why don't you go to court next week and turn yourself in? Um, you know, we, we were given a few more warnings this year simply because it puts the officer at risk, it puts the jail staff at risk, it puts everybody at risk. So there were some decisions um, on some very minor issues where we might have otherwise made an arrest. We, you know, did, we, we encouraged the officers not to do that. And there were various times throughout the course of the year, especially early in the pandemic, where I really tightened the screws on what we were doing. I just, we needed to make sure we had accurate information about the risk to exposure. We, it took us a little time to get ramped up on PPEs, masks and gloves and the equipment to make sure the officers were equipped appropriately. So there were times throughout the early parts of the pandemic that we really scaled down our um, efforts responding to things that we absolutely needed to and then triage the other ones. And so there's, that's probably the, the best indication of how the, the pandemic affected us last year. Okay. Arrest by area, you know, uh, again, you see the area two there, that's where the jail is. That number's always higher, okay. Okay? That number's always higher. <laughs> Domestic cases, uh, bad news, we, we, we teak back up a little bit on that, oh. uh, back up to, uh, to over 600. Uh, just about uh, two every day, two every 24-hour period, we're going to a domestic violence case. And um, 
tried our best to resolve that. We just can't crack the Chief, code. Chief, I've got a question. I know each one of these cases is different, but is, I mean, in your experience and the experience of your officers, is there typically or every once in a while a mental health component to this in terms of the domestic case? You cases? can probably always count on some substance abuse issue, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. Exacerbated by <laughs> mental illness eh, sometimes, but much more, much more prevalent is substance abuse, alcohol, yeah. drugs, that sort of thing. Um, okay. is much more of a, of a problem in terms of domestic violence issues. Um, okay. Mental health, occasionally, but if that's the issue, we probably focus on that more than anything. We're trying to sort through what the deal is, why are we there, um, and it's both of them, then it gets, com gets complicated, but um, substance abuse is much more prevalent in terms of domestic violence. Okay? And then we capture all kinds of data, when, where, which area of the community, age, race, who does it, when they do it, all that stuff, and this kind of just is indica indicative of that. Narcotics enforcement, um, continue to do that. Um, one of the areas we've found some successes is partnering with the federal government and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Anybody that we can identify as a person that distributes or sells a hard drug like heroin, and there is a fatal overdose for that. We are uh, forwarding that to the U.S. Attorney's Office and asking for prosecution. Uh, they've done that three times this year. And essentially what happens when that occurs is there is a sentence enhancement when it comes time for sentencing. So if the judge you know, is convinced that that's what happened and someone died for it, they get an additional amount of time uh, uh, on their sentence because that is enhanced. And so um, that's a trend that's happening across the country. We're really trying to attack the heroin, fentanyl stuff, which is the most dangerous, deadly, mm -hmm. and we deal with in terms of drug cases. Um, that's really the most destructive part that we have. And so we've really done that and seen some success in that regard. Chief, I've got a question. Yes, in sir. terms of uh, from 2019 to 2020, um, number of cases went from 164 to 102, number of suspects charged 200 to 110. I mean, is that good, bad, or indifferent? I mean, as so, far as... So, um, there are times when I look at the data and I sort of think to myself, how did the pandemic affect right. us? So if you look at the last three, two years before, that's pretty steady, right? The right. general steady and then last year. So I, yeah. I would need to see next year's data. Okay before I could say that 2020 was an anomaly or um, there's less of it, um, I'm guessing anomaly um, since the COVID stuff. Because we also, on the detective side too, we put some, um, some elements of, you know, stay at the station unless you have to during periods of time early in the pandemic. We really mm -hmm. were concerned about how that would affect us. So I was really concerned about a department-wide outbreak of the pandemic sure. and having no cops. So we worked hard to avoid that. Traffic accidents, um, traffic accidents are down. Um, I'm almost certain that's COVID related because there was less driving. Schools were closed for parts of the time. Businesses were closed, there were just less people out there. Less people means less cars. Um, and so there were less traffic accidents out there, which is um, the good news. Citations uh, were down a little bit. Periods of time where I told the traffic unit to scale back, you know, all that stuff. Traffic citations, we do all of our stuff by race and gender and age and location and time, you know, and we provide that information out to the general public. I have a question on traffic. Okay. Um, when did you reestablish the traffic unit? Was it in 2019 or 2018? Two years ago. Two years ago? Yeah, so, yeah, so okay. it'd be... And you didn't have a comparison there with last year, but, I mean, if you had a comparison, would it, I mean, in terms of the number of citations for traffic or... I'm going to show you a slide in a minute that I think it might be a better, better indicator of how positive it's okay. been. Okay. Right? Right. Traffic citations by all that stuff. Traffic locations. Walmart continues to be the, the location. One. The one on the left is the parking lot, okay? That's people backing and into each other at the parking lot, okay? That's minor stuff where they're, you know, taking out taillights and stuff. The one down the way there, 10th Avenue and Eisenhower, um, that whole location really seems to really get us right there to 10th and Eisenhower. Just really a lot of time and effort yeah. uh, goes into traffic accidents there. Some of those um, honestly end up being Lansing because they're on that side of the road too. So there's a little bit of um, information right. that wouldn't be here, you know, but it's on Lansing side. So um, 
That just really uh, requires a lot of our attention. Now, so here's the one that I would like to refer. Look at the far right-hand side. Our driving under the uh, DUI arrest went way up, um, and that is directly correlated with the traffic unit being okay. out there um, targeting impaired drivers, which is a problem for us. And so okay. that's probably an indication of uh, how successful the traffic unit's being. Um, and they're just very helpful to have it. We get the occasional complaint to you, which makes its way ultimately to me, and I can send the traffic unit out there to give it some attention, and that's happened quite a bit. Um, and that's just um, part of the business. Good deal. Occupancy protection. You know, I'm really happy with the city of Lemworth and Lemworth County in general. Typically, when they do the KDOT studies, we're at about 90% of uh, wearing their seat belts or car, uh, car seats. Um, so I'm really happy about that. Occasionally we still write a ticket for somebody that doesn't have a seat belt on, but I'm generally pretty happy about that. Uh, that message continues to get through very well. Happy about that. So you think the downward trend is really awareness and, and people of citizens in the, in the, yeah, I really in the do. county and also the city? Yeah, I really do. Uh, the KDOT comes out once or twice a year and does a study. They'll, you see the people standing at this corner taking notes on a clipboard once in a while. That's KDOT people. Uh, they're counting who's wearing their seatbelt, and we're typically at about 90%, so okay. pretty happy about that. Okay. PSIs, these are officer-related behavior complaints. So if an officer misbehaves regarding something, you will see that um, we had 12 last year. Um, why I talk about this is seven of those uh, issues were as a result from internal to the police department. Supervisors monitoring the behavior of the officers and deciding that corrective action was necessary on something that they did. We had five from outside of the department where a person called and said, I have a complaint about the police. They were rude. They cursed at me during a traffic stop or something like that. Um, and then we investigate all of those. And you can see the results of those uh, on the, on the left-hand side. Okay. Uh, we do uh, quite a bit of time and attention in monitoring the officer behavior. Chief, yes, sir. Uh, sustained on, on the left side, 2020, one was sustained. Three were exonerated, uh, not sustained one, unfounded with seven. What's the difference between exonerated and not sustained? Okay. Exonerated is we watch the videotape and it is absolutely crystal clear what happened. The officer acted appropriately. Okay. okay. The other one would be... Um, we're 95% sure the officer acted appropriately, but we're just not able to be that definitive that the officer is good to go on that. Okay. Um, or someone makes an initial complaint and then won't follow through. They won't come back down and talk to us or they won't follow through, something like that. Sustained means the officer absolutely misbehaved and got some sort of corrective action, some okay. disciplinary action. Um, and then the other one was unfounded. If it's unfounded, that means somebody just completely made the whole thing up, um, which happens once in a while, <laughs> one, one time. <laughs> completely made the whole thing up. Good with that? Questions for that? Thank you. And then um, in terms of um, bias-based policing, uh, we keep that on the left. This uh, 2020, we didn't have any complaints. On the right-hand side, you will see use of force reports filed by the officer. Every time an officer is involved in a use of force incident when they make an arrest, they're required to fill out a completely separate police report so that we can review that and sign off on whether they acted appropriately. Can I, can I go back? Just, yes, sir. I mean, the downward trend is obvious over the last three years. What, what do you attribute, attribute that to? Um, so we made a few less arrests this year. Yeah. And so that number is down a tiny bit. I would imagine if we made a few more arrests, it would go up. I try not to get focused entirely on the number but the percentage. Right. So we made 1,427 arrests last year. We had 112 incidents of use of force, which represents about 8%, and that's pretty standard. Okay. Um, statistically, it kind of goes up and down a tiny bit, but so that means 8 out of 100 times when we made an arrest, there was a, some element of use of force associated with it, and that's a pretty good number you know, if you look globally, that's a lot of arrest okay. and, a, you know, a little bit of use of force. So I'm generally, totally, yeah. generally satisfied with that. Okay. Here's the kinds of use of force we use. Um, chemical agents, taser, four times last year, got a little tougher to get the guy under arrest. So we had to taser somebody or use pepper spray. Um, most of the time you see in the middle, it's a little bit of wrestling, okay, with the, with the guy, an arm bar, something like that. Um, uh, an impact weapon one time, we had a pretty good fight, so I think they struck the guy with a baton. 
And then any time on the right-hand side column reflects when an officer displays their weapon for some reason. We didn't, dis we didn't discharge the weapon, but if they're displaying it, mm -hmm. they have it out and they're pointing it at somebody, they're required to tell me about it so I can make sure I understand why we're doing that. And then we always watch the video. The body camera videos help us support um, what the officers are doing. So uh, we pay a lot of attention to use of force. And then we keep it by race, gender, age, um, time, location, all of that stuff. We, we categorize that and make that available to the public to take a look at. Almost all the use of force we deal with is, is men. Men like to fight with the police. Or that's about testosterone more than anything. You're not taking me to jail, that kind of thing. Okay? I added this one this year. Battery. Cops take it on the chin occasionally. Um, 19 times we got punched in the face. Wow. Uh, five times we got spit on. One time we got head butted. And then for some reason, a guy flicked a cigarette at us during an arrest. So oh. that counts. So I felt like, um, you know, I wanted the, the public to know that occasionally it gets a little rough out there. Right. No serious injuries, thankfully. Uh, bumps and bruises, that sort of thing. But they're fun. The bomb unit, we still have a bomb unit. They go out about once a month on something. Keep in mind, now we're regional, right? We've handled Leavenworth, but we also handle... Um, so I think this year they've been on, they discovered some pipe bombs in a shed, some old ordinances, a few hand grenades, stuff like that. So about once a month, there's a need for the bomb unit to go out and find something that is either explosive or hazardous. And so they go out there and solve that for us. But these numbers include outside the city level? Mm -hmm. too? Yeah, anytime they respond. Right. right. Yeah, it's typically the it's typically the county is what we cover. Okay. Okay. Um, the guys rotate through like uh, Florence. The KU basketball team is having a game. They'll have the guys on standby. The unit the teams rotate, so we go up there a couple times a okay. couple times during the season and be on standby in case there's an issue at the basketball game or the campus. Okay. And then we uh, keep uh, information for the fire department. They went uh, 2,627 times last year. Generally, those are mostly EMS calls uh, and, and fire calls, if there's a fire. You'll have to talk to Chief Birch about what actually they did, but that's, <laughs> we keep the numbers. All right. <laughs> Animal control. Um, so we categorize all kinds of information about how many animals, we, animals that we handle. Um, let's get to this one. Um, we handled about 875 um, numbers like that. Our euthanasia rate is one and a half percent. Um, almost all of them are court ordered because the dog is dangerous, because the dog bit somebody, or the dog is critically injured or ill. Um, very rarely, if ever, anymore, we don't euthanize an animal for space. We have plenty of space down there, and we just don't uh, have the need to do that. I do want to talk just a little bit about our partnership with laws. I brought some information about them okay. because I think it's important to point out to you and the public about how helpful they are. Uh, so last year, just a few numbers, um, <clears throat> of the 538 dogs that the animal control facility took in, laws took 120 of them and facilitated their ultimate adoption. Um, mm -hmm. In the previous year, in 2019, that was closer to 50. So they have been very, very helpful in terms of facilitating that. Of the 268 cats that we brought down there, laws took 118 of them and facilitated their adoption. Uh, the big number here I want to talk about, uh, laws spent $17,500 on medical issues for animals that were injured or ill. Uh, the most recent example, we had a puppy that showed up with stray with a broken leg. They took the dog. They, pay, they will pay for the medical expenses. We pay for the initial sort of part of it, but, you know, we talked about the animal control van that we were considering. So we've made that decision. We're going to donate that to them. By, by far and away, they help us equally, um, and so uh, we were very happy to, to get that to them. But they do a great job. The Hope Clinic does a great job for us yeah. on the reduced uh, uh, um, vaccinations and spay and neutering program. They're just invaluable to us, and that's why these numbers are, are as reflective, as positive as they are, because without them, we, we probably wouldn't be able to meet that. So I wanted to make sure they got the proper credit for that. And tell us about the goats. The what now? The goats. The goats. That, that was the story of the year. Oh, that was the story of the year. So the goats escaped. The guy bought the goats. He was unloading them from the truck, and they escaped from him. And goats are really hard to catch, as it turns out. Um, they tried everything from traps to food to all kinds of stuff. They finally, after a few weeks, rounded one of them up. But in a little bit of opposition by the chief, a posse was formed. 
and about 25 people went and caught the other one under the bridge uh, by the courthouse on 4th Street. Yeah. <laughs> That's where they were hanging out, yeah. over by the courthouse. You'd see pictures of them on the courthouse steps. <laughs> they were just uh, quite charming characters. They didn't cause any damage or anything like that. I was worried about one of them getting hit by a car, but... We managed to catch one, and the posse managed to catch the other one a couple days later. Yeah, I remember, great, I remember right? seeing them yeah, when I was up at the courthouse. <laughs> so, the occasional non-domestic animal. So, yeah. we, that guy, I think the guy uh, gave the goats back to whoever he bought them for. That didn't work out well. So. Um, but, yeah, I do have a comment real quick, since we're on the, the animals, is that uh, in the adoption category, yeah, I, my husband and I, we adopted one from Animal Control probably a week and a half ago, and I want to shout out to Pam Hill and Teresa Murphy and, yeah, to Chief Kitchens. What a great job you do. And uh, the Hope uh, Shelter right. Foundation uh, helped out. But, uh, yeah, his name's Walter, and he's at home with Lucky and Adele, and they're having a great time. Okay. <laughs> great job. Congratulations, yeah. Walter. Yeah. <laughs> bike cases, um, I'm a little bit worried about that. Bike cases are trending up the last few years. Um, keeping in mind now a bike case, by and large, is typically a family or acquaintance circumstance where maybe a little kid is tugging at the dog's tail while they're eating and get nipped or something like that. Those are, by and large, the ones that we deal with. There are a few cases that are, you know, the, guy, the dog got out of the neighbor's fence and really caused some trouble. But most of those cases are reflective of family or acquaintance circumstances. And um, fortunately, most of them are not serious. I mean, some of them are a little bit serious, but some, you know, most of them are not. And then those are the numbers of the, uh, the enforcements. We do some dangerous dog stuff, running at large, other violations like they don't have their vaccinations up to date or their registration, that sort of thing. That's it for me on the data. Um, I'll answer whatever questions you might have. If you didn't see something you want, I can get that produced for you relatively quickly and get that to you as a follow-up question or other general law enforcement related stuff. We'd be glad to answer whatever questions you might have. Okay, uh, yeah, let's start with Commissioner Griswold. I have a question on shootings, and um, you know, I always take with a grain of salt what, what I see on social media, particularly Facebook, but do you, is that one statistic that you track, just e even if somebody, you know, fortunately is, is not hit with a bullet or anything, but do you track the number of shootings, uh, you know, bullets being discharged? So we get, a, we get a lot of calls, people reporting shots fired. Okay. We respond to all of them. If we're able to determine through evidence at the scene, there's a bullet hole mm -hmm. in the car, there's shell casings, something like that. The ring videos have been helpful occasionally, okay. right? We will document that, and if there's a crime, um, well, discharging a firearm is a crime, but if we're able to associate it with a particular person, we'll investigate that. So, <clears throat> I have, you know, in the last few years, that number has remained fairly steady. I think 57 in 2018, 65 in 2019, and 66 in 2000. So that's pretty steady in terms of the cases that we were able to specifically say, yes, that a shooting occurred. And that, so... Um, and that's a common issue in law enforcement in most cities, um, mm -hmm. you know, gunshots and that sort of thing. Gun violence, that sort of thing, is, is a pretty common problem that we deal with. And various reasons for that. I mean, some of it could be drug activity or... or, or drug activity um, mm -hmm. just, just the, yeah, the runs the dispute. gamut of issues. Yeah. We had the incident the other day at the gas station. I think probably everybody saw that. We've uh, been able to identify both of those people. We're actively sure. searching for them, and I would anticipate at some point soon charges here from that case. Um, but we're, we're, we're uh, far along the road on that case and pretty positive Good. about what we're doing with that. Yeah. So. Um, very quickly, technology. Dr drones, is the drones still being used in some way, shape, or form <laughs> to help you with your... Law enforcement. The uh, drone is the drone team is being used uh, pretty actively. We've searched for people and evidence okay. and all kinds of different stuff. We upgraded our drone program. I spent some of our drug money that we had. Well, I spent almost all the last of the drug money that we have from okay. um, to buy a fairly sophisticated drone with um, an L, an upgraded camera, night vision, infrared stuff okay. because that was sort of the next evolution okay. of our program. And so that got here. The the team is working on practicing with that because it's a little bit bigger it's probably um much bigger in terms of the other ones that you saw um but much more capable uh 55 or 60 minute battery power okay. so it could stay up for a while so um much different much better and uh we're going to have that operational here in a couple weeks i think 
Good. One other question on technology. Uh, a couple of years ago, you briefed us on probably some sophisticated and modern um, camera technology and computers and things where you would map like, you know, like the auditoriums in a school or something like that. And right. uh, where, where, where does that stand? Are you making progress as far as as far as that goes? With we had been making progress. Right. COVID, we did not go in the schools at all, uh, and it's been a little while, yeah. right? But we had mapped out. So there are six schools. We had mapped out one of them. We had started working on the other one. It takes, okay. the, the dilemma is logistics. School buildings are not empty, surprisingly, as much as you would think, even during the summer. Right. And it needs to be empty. And so um, that's why it, it takes a little while. We need to be able to have a few days in the building with the technology to do that. We're, we're going to work, we're going to get started on that when things open okay. back up, hopefully this fall, okay. uh, maybe this summer if they'll let us in there. But yeah, we're still working on that. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's really important, but I understand what happened in 2020. But thank you for that update. No problem. I have one final thing about training. So we've upgraded our training program and we've gotten some equipment. Um, at some point over the summer when it warms up, I'm going to send out an invitation for you guys to come out and watch some of our training oh, cool. because we're really focused on decision-making, de-escalation, using the right tools when we're confronted with a scenario. We've got a lot of new stuff that we're going to be using to train, which, prevent, which presents opportunities for visitors to come and watch and see. And so be on the lookout for that when it warms up. Um, out probably at the fire station. We'll have that stuff set up and have you, you know, come on out and take a look at what we're doing so you get a sense of what the police are training when they're out making decisions about use of force and arrests and that kind of stuff. Be uh, enjoyable, I think. Great. Okay. Uh, two questions. Uh, what percent or what number of your officers have been vaccinated? So, uh, the let's see, a week ago Friday they had their second shot. I I think the percentage number is 70%. Okay. 70% uh, of the staff at the police department have been uh, 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 vaccinated, both shots. Okay, Good. thank you. And this you know, isn't your call, but you'd probably have some input in, in it, uh, on it. Uh, have you heard any, any talk, trending a little bit in the U.S., of veterans' courts uh, for you know, non-felonious uh, type crimes, but you know, high misdemeanors? That sometimes they have veterans courts and I've have heard a of that. Veteran, uh, right, I've heard of that. Um, have like a cast, cost of volunteer with that veteran to kind of right. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard of that. I don't know that there's talk about doing that here. Um, my experience with that is the mental health court. We yeah. talked a lot about that. We were not able to uh, make that happen at the district court level. We do have it at the city court level, but veterans courts. I've seen some communities yeah. do that. Um, I would say that Leavenworth is probably a viable candidate for yeah. given that we have the VA and the, and the pretty high volume of VA of veterans here. But I, I've heard of that. I haven't heard any talk in the community about doing that. Yeah. Um, certainly I can talk to yeah, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, I just Thompson. know a guy in Alabama. He's kind of pushing it all around. He right. started a couple of them. And, you know, not for bank robberies or things sure. like that, but uh, sure. higher misdemeanors. Okay, thank you. Cool. Sure. Commissioner Wilson. Yeah, I don't remember the time frame exactly, but I think it was about a year ago. Uh, there was an online reporting process that was implemented mm -hmm. where you can file a complaint online. Is that being utilized still? So we, had, we have been talking and working towards online reporting where a person could file a criminal complaint. Correct. Right? And there, so it's called the Citizen Services Module. That's what right? it is, yeah. So in the last... 60 days or so, we have been identifying vendors to buy the kiosk, to put the kiosk at the station that a person can come into the station and not have to see an officer, they can do that. In line with that, when we get that acquired and installed, we're very likely to turn on the online citizen services module. My goal is this year, so that someone can file a criminal complaint at home uh, would they have access to the internet? Now, it's not going to be every crime. Yeah. It'll be some fairly minor ones. We're, so we're working out the logistics of things like evidence, right? The ring cameras. How are they going to get us a copy of the video associated with the report? So there's some technical logistical issues that are quite complex that need to be worked out. But I, my goal is to have that turned on this year. Um, and we're... Um, a few months, but I think we're going to get that turned on this year. Okay. We have it. it. It's just a matter of turning it on and making sure we're good. 
All right. Appreciate it, Chief. Yes, sir. Okay. Anything else? No, I didn't have anything. Uh, great report as usual. Thank you, Chief Kitchens. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now we'll uh, wrap it up. So I'll just go around the bin. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, did you have anything? You wanted to... Actually, I don't. You don't? Okay. Uh, nothing. Nothing. No, I just, the only thing I have is um, I noticed the report came out, the Monday report from the county health department, and uh, they were, the, the stats were very encouraging yesterday in terms of COVID-19. New community cases was only 18, and the positive uh, test percentage was 5.33%, and the daily case counts for 14-day moving average were 8.57, which dramatic drops when we, when we in mid November, when we were considering, you know, the mask ordinance and things like that. So all I can say is that just encourage people are doing, I think by and large, people are doing the right things in terms of their public health measures. And of course, each, as each day goes along, there's more and more vaccinations happening within the community and that'll continue. So we just need to keep up the good work there. And, um, uh, that's all I have. Okay. So um, everyone out there in TV land and everyone here in present, uh, have a great rest of the week. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>